Following a week of negotiations, the culinary union will now decide whether to strike. Plus... I remember the first time we played here, you know, we had our names up in giant letters uh, right above unlimited shrimp. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's properly humbling. Magicians Penn and Teller celebrate 30 years as Las Vegas headliners this week on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt. Welcome to Nevada Week. I'm Amber Renee Dixon. Magic and comedy duo Penn and Teller reflect on three decades of performing in Las Vegas ahead. But we begin with the culinary and bartenders unions, whose members voted overwhelmingly to authorize a citywide strike if the unions cannot come to terms on a new five-year contract with MGM Resorts, Caesars Entertainment, and Wynn Resorts. The unions and the three resort companies held negotiations this week and joining us now to discuss the progress of those talks is McKenna Ross, a reporter with the Las Vegas Review Journal. McKenna, welcome to Nevada Week. Thank you for having me. So as we speak, it is October 5th, Thursday. The union has now met with MGM Resorts as well as Caesars and will meet with Wynn Resorts on Friday. What can you tell us about how negotiations have gone so far? Well, these negotiations have been going on since about April with the major employers that you mentioned, MGM, Caesars, and Wayne Resorts. Um, we know that this citywide contract ended on June 1st, but they've had been taking uh, contract extensions until about mid-September when the Culinary Union decided um, that they should end those uh, contracts at those properties and um, have been working under you know, expired contracts. And what are they telling you as far as how negotiations are going? You know, the culinary union has said that they don't feel that, you know, enough is being done. This week they said that they felt that the companies had come to negotiate, so they felt there was some progress there. But at the same time, they are still uh, strongly suggesting a strike is possible. And if a deal is not reached by the end of the week, then what happens? The culinary secretary treasurer, Ted Papa George, has said, quote, all bets are off on setting a strike deadline. Now, what that means is not necessarily that they would strike the next day, um, but it would mean that they would set a deadline on when a strike could happen. Um, that really ups the pressure on the negotiations to get something done by that day, that deadline. And if uh, that deadline occurs and passes, then you know, those um, workers could go on strike. And that's something that's been, I think, a little bit confusing for people is that they've authorized a strike. They're not striking and they haven't yet said by this date, if we don't have a deal, we're going to strike. But that is the next step is setting a strike deadline. And we're talking about tens of thousands of employees who work on the Las Vegas Strip potentially walking out if they don't get what they want. What is it that the union wants and why does the union argue it deserves these benefits? The union is fighting for what they call the winning, the winning the largest wage increases ever negotiated in its history. Now, they're not being specific about what they um, want exactly in terms of wages and benefits, but, um, you know, efforts to increase the wages substantially. Um, they're also fighting for reduced workloads um, and lowering steep housekeeping quotas um, and mandate, mandating daily room cleanings. Um, other things like on the job safety protections, um, making sure that the uh, extended recall rights are involved and um, part of the contract adding something like a no strike clause that doesn't prevent the union from taking action at um, non unionized restaurants on a casino's property. Why do they and say they, they deserve they argue, this? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah, they, they argue that they um, deserve this because they the gaming companies have done exceedingly well since the pandemic, since coming out of the pandemic, and they want a piece of that profit, you know, and the, the negotiations related to workload and workforce safety are meant to address all these changing responsibilities and the staffing sizes that have dropped um, since the pandemic. What are the resort companies saying to you when you reach out to them? Now, they're, they're pretty tight-lipped in their responses, but they do say that the negotiations are something that they're working very hard on, that um, they have a long history of, of uh, succeeding in these negotiations to, to achieve a, a contract that everyone is happy with, and they ultimately want to um, 
commit to getting that, that negotiated contract. For some context, when was the last time that the culinary union authorized a strike? And then what was the result of that? Sure. The last time they authorized a strike was actually the last contract negotiation back in 2018. So they had um, an authorization vote done sometime in May. And um, they said if if a negotiation isn't a deal isn't reached by, you know, June 1st, we you know might be able to strike. And, um, you know, the negotiations went seemingly well. They uh, reached tentative deals with all of the major employers um, shortly after June 1st. Okay, so it didn't go to a strike then. When was the actual last time that there was a strike uh, of this magnitude, mm -hmm. a citywide strike that could potentially happen? It's been quite a while, um, nearly four decades. The last one was in 1984, and it was against um, about 20 or so um, strip properties. It really um, caught them off guard, actually. And so it was a massive event. It lasted 67 days and it was about 17,000 workers that struck alongside the bartenders union and unions that covered musicians and others, um, stagehands and like that. So it was a, a pretty long one. And um, experts have told me that it caught the companies off guard at that point. And that's possibly why it took so long to uh, achieve that. Um, and there were, you know, confrontations and there was an estimated, um, you know, workers estimated that they lost to $75 million in wages and benefits. And it's, it, there's an estimate out there that says the region lost a similar number in um, tourism revenue. Wow. Um, as far as the experts you've talked to about the likelihood of a strike this time, what are they telling you? You know, they really uh, weigh it both ways. You know, in, in previous years, there have been, um, you know, th there have been negotiations that have gone very close, but always stopped. Um, but also at the same time, there was a more available worker pool of potential strike breakers that they could pull from to staff the resorts um, if a strike did occur. And nowadays, there's a, a lot more power on the labor side of things. We have a very tight labor market as is. And um, and then these people, they they really uh, want to make it by the uh, by these major events that are coming up. That's another part of it. They have to worry about um, getting this deal done and avoiding a strike before we have a, a massive calendar of events coming, not not including you know, conventions and of course, Formula One in November and um, all the way in December, or sorry, all the way in uh, into next year, the, the Super Bowl. Right, of course, they have some leverage there. McKenna Ross, thank you for your reporting and to follow McKenna Ross, go to lasvegasreviewjournal.com. We move now to magic. Magicians Penn and Teller recently extended their residency at the Rio for three more years. In total, the legendary pair has performed 30 years in Las Vegas, a milestone I asked Penn Gillette about. He's the speaking member of the magical duo when I sat down with him and Teller backstage at the Rio. 30 years in Las Vegas. Yeah, Jiminy Cricket, how'd that happen? <laughs> what do you attribute your longevity to? Uh, I think I have one of the worst vantage points for that. You know, I don't really, I'm not really able to tell. We don't write material um, in a, oh, this will go over well with this particular audience. We write the stuff we want to do. I mean, if you talk to uh Howard Stern or Paul McCartney or Madonna, they'll all tell you they should have been more famous than they were or than they are. And that's the kind of ambition you really need in show business. Teller and I never had it. We intended to play, um, you know, small theaters, 100 to 200, and we were very happy doing cruise ships and doing anything that happened to come up. We hadn't got ourselves into the cruise ship market, but that's what we were working on because our mentor, our hero, you know, Johnny Thompson, who was our favorite magician, the best magician, and who worked with us for years and years and years on everything. Uh, that's what Johnny did. And we just thought that's what a working professional does. And we, we always intended to be small time. Which so we is could why do the stuff we wanted to do. I've read that you've said people ask you, did you always want a show in Las Vegas? Isn't this kind of your dream? And you that's, say no. That's the that's the weirdest thing in the world. Uh, and, the, and I won't say who it is because it, it makes me sick. But there are magicians in Vegas who say all they ever wanted was to have a theater in Vegas. And you say, well, didn't you care about the show? I mean, if if you said to me right now that I could have the, the level of money that I have, the level of you know, success that I've had. I could have all of that, but I wouldn't be doing this show. It wouldn't even be a decision. 
I have no desire to do that. The idea of wanting, uh, building your career based on a venue is to me so sad, you know. I, 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 we had to answer the question carefully because we were, you know, we did Broadway three times and people would say, was it always your dream to be on Broadway? And we would say, no, never, never crossed our minds. And we didn't mean to be disrespectful or, um, or uh, in any way unpleasant. It's just that we've always thought about the show and not the venue. And Broadway meant nothing to us compared with we want to do that show. It's about the it's, show. It's always about the tricks and the stuff we're doing, you know, the bits. Before we get too far, let's Have we address. gotten too far? We got it. Okay, I mean, sorry. I haven't even got my, past my first page oh, of I'm questions. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll go to yes and no from now on. <laughs> I know, better speed this up, huh? Hey, well, why does Teller not talk? Well, that actually... Or will Teller talk? That, that predates me. Uh, when I first met Teller, he was uh, teaching high school Latin outside of Trent, New Jersey. And uh, he was doing, you know... Talking a lot. Sh shows as an amateur. You know, he was doing weekend shows and evening shows at libraries and so on. And since college, he'd been working silently. So we first started working together. We were two acts on the same bill at a Renaissance festival. And then we started doing bits together in order to keep the integrity of Teller's solo material. He was staying silent. Our, and then that just developed. I mean, there's a lot of really smart stuff that we exploited about having one person in the act silent, but it was not by design. We, we stumbled into it. You know, Tommy Smothers said to us that the, um, the brilliance of having one person not talk is it allows the audience to project upon one person easier and Teller can guide that in, a really, um, in really subtle and wonderful ways, but it allows the audience to have more of a presence on stage. Okay, so Las Vegas, over the last 30 years, yeah. how have you seen it change? Well, you know, uh, when we first got here, um, virtually everybody that came to Vegas and went to shows, um, anybody that was younger than maybe I am now, were coming to were coming to Vegas ironically. They went to see bad shows on purpose. They ate at bad restaurants on purpose, you know? People who didn't smoke cigars and didn't drink martinis smoked cigars and drank martinis and went to see a bad impressionist, you know? You know, you'd go to a steakhouse and you'd see a show with a guy doing a Elvis impersonation, and you knew that wasn't good. If you lived anywhere else, it wasn't. You were more sophisticated than that. And then, uh, uh, instantly, and I just tried to snap my fingers and couldn't. Instantly, um, in the in the mid '90s, very very quickly, uh, everything changed, and there were actually good shows. You know, there was Blue Man Group. There were acrobatic shows. They're actually interesting. Uh, you know, there's Mac King, and um, there are all these really good shows, so people were no longer going ironically, and there also ended up being good restaurants. So the I mean, quality we, has improved. Uh, I mean, the restaurants in Vegas in the '90s were an absolute joke. I mean, if you wanted, you know, um, steak and garlic bread. I mean, I'm a, I'm a vegan now, but uh, that was fine. Or they shrimp cocktails. Yeah, shrimp cocktails. You know, I remember the first time we played here. You know, we had our names up in giant letters. Uh, right above unlimited shrimp, um, <laughs> you know it's 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 properly humbling, and uh, but you didn't have good stuff. You had stuff that people came to make fun of. Mm -hmm. You went to a bad show, had a bad dinner, and did things you didn't do, and then uh, over the past thirty years, that's changed. So now you can come to Vegas, and I, we've got we've got better shows than Broadway in many cases. We've got better restaurants than probably any place but, you know, New York and uh, in L.A., you know. Uh, and uh, so people can now come uh, without the irony. And that, that's, a, that's an incredible change to be a city that was made fun of to a city that's actually good. So there's a New York Times Magazine article from 1988 that you were quoted in. You were filming the movie Penn and Teller Get Killed, which I see the poster for in here. Um, it was being filmed in Atlantic City, and you said at the time, Vegas is either seedy glitz or glitzy glitz, but in Atlantic City, there's this real city out there. 
Yeah, there was there there was a real city out there, and of course, uh, has your stance changed? I was, though, yeah, in completely Vegas? because Vegas um, now has a, uh, a a really robust and interesting community um, outside of the Strip. I mean, and you've uh, raised children here. Yeah, but both of my children were born in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Mox is eighteen, and Zoltan is um, is uh, seventeen, and they even have. Um, much to my surprise, Las Vegas accents, which always startles me a little bit. <laughs> What's uh, a Las Vegas accent? Well, you can hear it. I, I, I can't describe it, but it's certainly not my Northeast accent or, or, or Teller's Northeast accent. But, I mean, now we've got the Smith Center. Right. You know, a Smith Center, you take all of uh, what people see as Vegas away, you still have a community with, with thriving arts. And we've even got, I mean, there's a place called Vic's, a uh, jazz club where you perform with yeah, your group. Yeah, but it's, uh, I mean, uh, besides that, <laughs> it's a good jazz club. Las Vegas as a potential Hollywood 2.0, as Las Vegas resident Mark Wahlberg. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I looked at that article. I, I don't know what it means. I mean, Hollywood isn't really Hollywood. They shoot movies and TV shows everywhere, and uh, executives don't care. I mean, I, I guess he has a plan, but Mark Wahlberg uh, knows show business in ways that I never will and don't aspire to. Okay. Well, and he did <laughs> lobby the Nevada legislature this past session sure. to get some more tax credits for film production. He's one of those grown-up people who lobby people. Okay. I, I, I don't really think about, I don't really <laughs> but, about that. I just do a show. Okay. Politically, <laughs> you describe yourself as a libertarian. Though. I used to be. Used once to be. once um, I got an email that said we're, we're protesting people wearing masks, that second I stopped being a libertarian. So I was libertarian. Now I'm, um, I'm anything that's not MAGA. By being outspoken like this, do you get concerned about who's going to come to your show and, or not come to your show as a result? Yeah, we've been boycotted by people before. I remember once uh, after we'd done an episode of Bull about chiropractic, um, a bunch of people came to our show. That was show. your documentary show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, a bunch of people came to the show, like 75 of them and said, we came here to tell you that after your chiropractic show, we're boycotting your show. And I said, well, I, I don't think you understand the term boycott. Um, <laughs> I know, I, I think, you know, I'm, uh, I'm an outspoken atheist and um, I listen to gospel music. Little Richard, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, um, many of the important, you know, um, um, uh, uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp and, uh, Why? You just keep Why naming do you them. listen to I listen to that because it was the best music of the time. And although I'm an atheist, I don't say these are Christians. I'm not going to go to see their show. And I have incredible respect for Christians. And I think they do the same for me. I think there's a lot of people who are believers who come see our show, which doesn't have doesn't have too strong an atheist message now and again, a little bit of skepticism. And they come to our show, and we have a lot of people who write us notes saying, I love Jesus, and uh, I love your show. And that, that is what it means to be in, a, uh, in being an open, loving society. And uh, we have a lot of people who are MAGA that come to our show, and I had no secret about my dislike of Trump. And they still come to our show. And that's the way it should be. Had you not had the success that you have had, would you still be street performing? Uh, as you did earlier in your career. I blew my voice out. Um, medically, I, I don't know as I could. Okay. But uh, I met someone who was very, very uh, close friends, and very close to Bob Dylan, said that if he'd had no success, he'd be playing those same songs wherever he happened to be. And um, I would not compare ourselves with a Nobel laureate, but um, it's certainly true for us. I mean, not exactly true, because if we hadn't had the success, uh, some of the tricks we do are expensive, and we wouldn't be able to do them. We wouldn't have the best crew in the world working for us, but um, we'd still be doing stuff like this. And I also think, um, and maybe this is... Um, this is uh, hubris or something, but I think that if we not had this success, we'd have enough success to support ourselves. I think the, I think we'd be working. 
and we'd be happy working. I mean, the the weird thing is, um, uh, we were really happy doing our shows before we had what other people call success. We were we were paying our rent. We were we were feeding ourselves. We had friends, and we were doing shows that we thought were as good as the shows we think are now. And if we're deluded about how good our shows are, we were deluded back then. And God bless us. <laughs> Recognizing <laughs> it. So, okay, back to that 1988 article. You said, quote, everyone becomes a parody of themselves. I mean, look at Mick Jagger, Bob Dylan, and Bruce Springsteen. But we aren't there yet. I just hope we don't lose our goofiness. Uh, yeah. Are uh, you there yet? Uh, I don't know. That's Once again, that's a question... Um, someone else would have to answer. I mean, uh, actually, that, that sounds like I'm being unkind to Bob Dylan uh, or disrespectful, but Bob said that himself, you know. There are times that you end up just doing what you were doing and what people like. And probably, I mean, the best example of that is uh, is Mick Jagger, and he probably doesn't care. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I think he, and I think he would probably also admit that. I mean, Bob, uh, Mick Jagger said when he was, in his early 20s, I'm certainly not going to be singing Satisfaction when I'm 40. Now he's singing Satisfaction at 80. So um, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I like to think we're always doing new stuff and we aren't in a, in a cookie cutter uh, parody of ourselves. But once again, I'm not the one that can answer that. You might be sitting in the audience and think, uh, how can he say that? There's they're complete self parodies and we wouldn't be able to see it. Um, but we aren't doing the same stuff we did <laughs> last week. Um, we write new stuff all the time and we, we write, I think more magic than just about anybody else ever has. And, um, I mean, how so, many tricks did you do just for the television show Penn and Teller fool us? How well, many Penn and Teller fool us? We've done so far, something like 150. Wow. They were all uh, unique Over tricks. Over 10 seasons. I mean, we just finished, uh, we just finished season, uh, the last season, and we did 20 show, 21 shows, and they were all uh, all new tricks. The point of that show, though, is magicians trying to fool you. Yeah. What kind of impact do you think you've had on magic with that show? I mean, 10 seasons. Yeah, I don't know, run. you know. Uh, uh, I don't want to get uh, unpleasantly sentimental, but we've now had people on the show who started Magic because they saw the show. That's why they started, and now they're on the show. And um, that's a kind of um, powerful emotional feeling to see that because I don't know what impact we've had on the world, but that's some impact on those people. And you know that that's kind of enough. We also worked very hard. I mean, um, uh, magic is. I mean, the most damning thing I can say about it is the magic circle in London didn't allow women in until the nineties. In the nineties, I mean, it, insane. In our lifetime, they weren't allowing women in. Uh, that's insane. And magic, uh, you know, at least the turn of this last century, even that late was um, was all people who identified as male and identified as white. And um, uh, that has, uh, our producers pushed very hard for that on our show to get um, people of color and non-binary people and people who identify as women on the show. They worked very hard for that. And certainly we can't have anything to do with the booking or the show wouldn't be fair. But certainly in, in our discussions with them, we pushed really, really hard for that. Now, I don't know as we can take any credit because the biggest difference you see in magic is that people don't look like us. And that's a huge change. But I don't know as we can take credit or if that's simply time. You bring up the magic circle. I don't quite understand how it works, but they won't let you two in, correct? No. Which is really strange. And this is true. And it's because you well, they, explain it's because your they give tricks. away secrets, yeah. Uh, but it's it's crazy because they um, wrote to us and said we're doing in our museum, we're doing a whole Penn and Teller display. Could we have some of your stuff? Hmm. And we said, well, we'll give you the helmets we wore for the first bullet catch. Oh, so you're and we'll give, give you our bullet. We gave it all to them. Hmm. We gave them all this stuff for their for their museum, 
and then said afterwards, and I also, um, when, uh, when Paul Daniels died, um, who was the, the, the most popular magician in, in England and also a good friend of ours, when he died, I wrote the obituary for the uh, Magic Circle uh, newsletter, whatever it was. So we, that happened at the same time. We gave him a bunch of stuff, and we I also wrote that. And then we wrote just just a little email that said, oh, by the way, we haven't gotten our membership cards. And why share your secrets and uh, your tricks? And well, but, but then the punchline was they said, well, we love you, but the board of directors has voted you can't be in. Mm. Um, because saying that secrets are important to magic is an insult to every magician. There couldn't be anything more insulting. It's like saying that you can look at Miles Davis's charts to sketches of Spain and that that somehow makes that record uh, less powerful, less real. Now, you can screw up magic by right afterwards saying how it's done and that moment can crumble. That can happen. But the fact that all our tricks are explained on YouTube is fabulous because there's people there that want to be doing magic later after we're dead, which is, you know, the, today. And, um, and uh, they need that information so they can do better stuff than we ever did. Penn, Teller, thank you so much well, for thank joining you. Nevada Week. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's a good state. It sure is. Our thanks to Penn and Teller for the time and to McKenna Ross of the Las Vegas Review Journal and to you for watching. I'll see you next week on Nevada Week.